the law reported by Imam Ibn Hibban. But the Prophet Sallallahu said, Sallallahu Alma Nafi'an wa ta'awwadhu min wa ta'awwadh billahi min ilmin la yanfa'. That the Prophet Sallallahu said, you should ask Allah to make your knowledge beneficial and you should seek refuge in Allah from knowledge that does not benefit. And Imam al tibi in his explanation of Sahih Muslim, he said the meaning because actually our beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to seek refuge in Allah from knowledge that does not benefit. Imam al-Tibi rahmatullahi alayhi said knowledge that does not benefit is knowledge that a person doesn't act upon. Is knowledge that a person doesn't act upon. So we ask Allah to make us from those that act upon this knowledge and make it beneficial for us in this life and the next. This topic that the brothers <coughs> or the community selected as it relates to fornication, adultery, and pornography is an important topic. And it's important for the believers to know that Islam is a religion that teaches aqidah. It's a religion that teaches worship. It's a religion that teaches belief. And it's a religion that teaches correct and upright moral character. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, "Al-yawma akmaltu lakum dinukum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-Islam adina." As Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Ma'idah, in the beginning of the surah, "Today I have perfected my favor. I have perfected your religion, and I am pleased with Islam as your religion." So Islam is a complete religion. Islam is a complete way of life. It teaches belief, it teaches worship, and it teaches character. Upright, moral character and values. Sheikh Abdurrahman al-Sa'di rahmatullahi alayhi said, من علوم القرآن ومقاسده علم الأدب والأخلاق الكاملة He said, from the knowledge of the Qur'an, from the knowledge of the Qur'an, and that which the Qur'an intends to rectify is knowledge of values and upright moral character. An upright moral character. Likewise, our Lord Taala says in Surah Al-Isra, إِنَّ هَذِ الْقُرْآنِ يَهْتِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ Indeed, this Qur'an, this book, guides to that which is better. It guides to that which is upright. Shaykh Abdurrahman al-Sa'di rahmatullahi alayhi said an explanation of those verses in Surah Al-Isra, the ninth verse, where Allah said, this Qur'an, guys, said that which is better, that which is upright. He said, أَيْ أَعْدَلْ وَأَعْلَى مِنَ الْأَقَائِدْ وَالْأَعْمَالْ وَالْأَخْلَاقِ He said that the Qur'an, when Allah mentioned that it guys said that which is upright, it means that which is just and the highest as it relates to belief, as it relates to actions, and as it relates to character. So our deen guides us to the best belief, our deen guides us, guides us to the best actions, and our deen guides us to the best of character and values. Then he said, Shaykh Abdurrahman al-Sa'di said, فَمَنْ اِحْتَدَى بِمَا يَدْعُوا إِلَيْهِ الْقُرْآنِ كَانَ أَكْمَلَ النَّاسِ وَأَقْوَمَهُمْ وَأَحْدَاهُمْ فِي جُمِيعِ أُمُورِهِ So whoever takes the guidance of the Qur'an, then that individual, and that which the Qur'an calls to, then that individual is the best of the people. He's the best of the people. And he's the most upright of the people. And he's the most guided of the people in all of his affairs. In all of his affairs. So that's in his belief, that's in his actions, that's in his character, in all of his affairs. There's no aspect of the life of that individual except that Islam rectifies it. So in that regard, we find that Allah Azza wa Jal orders, encourages, and reminds the believers of upright moral character. 
Allah Azza wa Jal described this Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wa inna kala ala khuluqin azim. Indeed, you have upright moral character. This is how Allah Azza wa Jal described His Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Likewise, Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah An-Nahl, Inna Allah ya'mur bil adli wal ihsan wa ita'i dil kurba wa yanha an al fahshai wal munkari wal baghi. In Surah An-Nahl, the 90th verse, indeed, Allah orders with justice and good and family ties, and Allah forbids profanity and indecency and evil. So Allah Azza wa Jal orders us to be upright, to have high moral character, manners, and values. And Allah Azza wa Jal forbids the Muslim to be someone who has low moral character, someone who is indecent. Likewise, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, "Qul inna ma harrama Rabbi al-fawahisha ma zahra minha wa ma batan." Allah Azza wa Jal said to the Prophet, "Say to the people, our Lord, Allah Azza wa Jal forbids that which is indecent, whether it's hidden." or whether it's inside. Allah forbids that which is indecent. Likewise, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, الشَّيْطَانِ يَعِدُكُمُ الْفَقْرِ وَيَعْمُرُكُمْ بِالْفَحْشَاءِ Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Baqarah, the shaitan, he promises, promises you with poverty and he orders you to do that which is indecent. He orders you to do that which is indecent. Likewise, Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surat Al-Furqan, and this one is what has preceded is related to indecency, all forms of indecency. But now we're going to mention that which is specifically re related to indecency as it relates to fornication, adultery, and the likes. Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surat Al-Furqan, beginning with Tawheed, talking about the people of Tawheed, Talking about the people that observe, acknowledge, and implement the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal. He said, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرٍ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَى أَثَامًا يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابَ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ وَيَقْلُدْ فِيهِ مُحَانًا Allah Azza wa Jal said it in Surah Al-Furqan. Verse 68, speaking about the believers, and when the believers hear the verses of Allah Azza wa Jal, where Allah speaks about the believers, their characteristic, their beliefs, and their description, it's for a believer to give his attention. Because if you say that you are from those who believe, when Allah describes them, that's an indication for you to assess yourself. Am I implementing that which Allah has mentioned about the description of the believers, or am I not? Allah Azza wa Jal says, those who do not call on another deity other than Allah. So that's Tawheed. Those who do not call on another deity other than Allah. And those who do not kill unjustly. So they establish Tawheed, and they do not kill unjustly. Then what does Allah said? وَلَا يَزْنُونَ they do not commit fornication and adultery. So in this verse, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned Tawheed, and he mentioned killing, and he mentioned fornication and adultery. Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned all of that, and he mentioned fornication and adultery. He said they do not commit this. And whoever does that, they will find their punishment. They will find their punishment. Likewise, Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Mu'minun, once again, the beginning of Surah Al-Mu'minun, describing the attributes of the believers. And when we hear those attributes of those believers, it's time for us to assess ourselves. Because our Lord Taala is informing us of the characteristics, the ways, and the attributes of the individuals that He is pleased with. Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Mu'minun, 
والذين هم لفروجهم حافظون إلا على أزواجهم أو ما ملكت أيمانهم فإنهم غير ملومين فمن ابتغى وراء ذلك فأولئك هم العادون In the beginning of Surah Al-Mu'minun And my dear brothers and sisters Allah Azza wa Jal begins the surah with قَدْ أَفْلَهَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Allah Azza wa Jal began the surah by saying The believers are successful The believers are successful Then Allah Azza wa Jal goes on to mention What are the characteristics of those believers الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Those who have concentration and focus in their prayer So Allah goes on to mention the characteristics And from those characteristics in verse number 5 Allah says وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِذُونَ Those who protect their privates Those who are cautious of their privates إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ Except for their spouses Or that which their right hand possesses There's no blame upon them Then Allah Azza wa Jal says فَمَنْ ابْتَغَى وَرَاءَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْعَادُونَ And whoever goes beyond that then you are an enemy. So Allah Azza wa Jal has described the individuals, male or females, that do not protect their privates. Allah described them as sinners? No, Allah said they are enemies. They are enemies. Those individuals have gone beyond the bounds. In that regard, so in these verses, Allah Azza wa Jal is describing the believers. Allah Azza wa Jal describing their attributes. What are some things they do? What are some things they don't do? So a believer has to assess himself and bring himself to account before he is brought to account. Specifically as it relates to fornication and adultery, if you read the verses related to that in Surah Al-Isra, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّينَ إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاهِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا Allah says, do not go near fornication and adultery. It is despicable and it is a bad way. The scholars of Islam say, such as Imam Al-Qurtubi rahmatullahi alayhi, he said, when Allah said don't go near fornication and adultery, this is stronger than Allah say don't commit fornication and adultery. Allah didn't say don't commit fornication and adultery. Allah said, don't go near it. And that's stronger. That's stronger when Allah said, don't go near it. Likewise, it was mentioned by Shaykh Abdurrahman al Saadi. He said, an an zina min an an He said, when Allah, the same thing like Imam Al Qurtubi mentioned, when Allah said, don't go near it, it's stronger. Then Allah is saying, don't do it. Because when Allah Azza wa Jal says, don't go near it, يَشْمَلْ أَنَّحْيَ عَنْ جَمِيءِ مُقَدَّمَاتِهِ وَدَوَاعِيهِ فَإِنَّ مَنْ حَامَ حَوْلَ الْحِمَا يُوشِكُ أَنْ يَكَعَ فِيهِ He said, it's stronger, the wording that Allah gave it, where he said, don't go near it, is stronger than Allah saying, don't do it. Because when Allah Azza wa Jal said, don't go near it, Allah is forbidding us to do anything that leads to it. So anything and everything that leads to it, that's also forbidden. That's also forbidden. Because indeed, if an individual goes near the border, it's possible that he falls into it. So everything that leads to fornication and adultery is also forbidden. Allah didn't say don't do it, Allah said don't even go near it. So in that regard, every single thing, and, if, and that's one of the things that we're going to look at at this time that we have with our brothers and sisters, every single thing, there are many things that Islam has encouraged and many things that Islam has forbidden because, not the action itself, but because what the action leads to. But because of what the action leads to. And we'll look at that in a few minutes. Likewise, from our, the authentic sunnah of our beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa as it relates to fornication and adultery and that which leads to it. 
You had the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu reported in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim to show you the severity of it. That the Prophet sallallahu said, لا يزني زاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن Our beloved messenger sallallahu said that the believer does not commit fornication and adultery except that faith leaves him at that time that he does it. His faith leaves him, meaning he becomes very low in faith. He becomes very low, extremely low in faith. Likewise, you have the hadith of Sahal bin Mu'adh in Sahih Bukhari, where the Prophet ﷺ said, Man yadman li ma bayna lihyayhi wa ma bayna faqidayhi aw rijlayhi admanu lahu al-jannah. Our beloved Messenger وسلم, said, whoever can guarantee for me that which is between his cheeks, yani his mouth, and that which is between his legs, yani his privates, whoever can guarantee for me that he protects his mouth, yani between his two cheeks, his facial cheeks, and he protects that which is between his legs, I can guarantee for him Jannah. So our beloved Messenger وسلم, is reminding the believers of the dangers of the tongue and the dangers of the private. And if you can protect it, if you can protect it and control it, then the Prophet وسلم, has informed that he will guarantee for you Jannah. He will guarantee for you Jannah. You have a similar hadith reported in the Muslim of Imam Ahmed on the authority of Ubad ibn Samit radiallahu anhu where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said idmanu li sitten min anfusikum admanu lakum al jannah guarantee six from yourself and I will guarantee you jannah in the previous hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said guarantee for me how many? two that which that you protect your mouth and you protect your privates in this one, the Prophet ﷺ said, guarantee for me six. Yani, I'm putting three, three. Six, and I will guarantee you Jannah. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ustuku idha hudiftum, hadiftum. Be honest and truthful when you speak. That's one. Wa'awfu idha wa'adtum. And fulfill the trust if you're entrusted. Then he said, wa'addu idha tumintum. And complete the promise, if you make a promise, or if someone entrusts you with something, complete it. وَحْفَذُوا فُرُوجَكُمْ And preserve your privates. وَغُدُّ أَبْصَارِكُمْ وَغُدُّ أَبْصَارَكُمْ And lower your gates. وَقُفُّ أَيْدِيَكُمْ And restrict your hands. The Prophet ﷺ said, guarantee six from yourself and I will guarantee you Jannah. Again, be honest when you speak. Fulfill the trust. Complete what you promise. Protect your privates. Lower your gaze and restrict your hands. Yani, do not fight Muslims. Do not fight, do not kill. The Prophet said, if you guarantee these six for me, I will guarantee for you Jannah. Likewise, you had the hadith in Sahih Bukhari where the Prophet ﷺ was shown the hellfire. Our beloved Messenger ﷺ was shown the hellfire. It's a long hadith. But in that hadith, and the Prophet ﷺ was walking with Jibreel and other angels. In that hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was shown a pit in the hellfire. And it's in Sahih Bukhari. He was shown a pit in the hellfire. And when he looked into that pit, he could see men and women naked. And they were burning. And they were screaming and yelling. They were screaming and yelling. When the Prophet saw, and every time the fire, the fire would uh, become high, they would scream and they would yell. And the Prophet وسلم, asked Jibreel والسلام, who were the naked men and the naked women? Jibreel والسلام, said the men and the women who commit fornication and adultery. The men and the women who commit fornication and adultery, they, are, they will be in a pit in the hellfire burning. They will be burning in the hellfire. So my dear brothers, these are 
narrations that are related to fornication and adultery. Likewise, you have the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu and this is more specifically for the women, in the hadith of Abdurrahman bin Auf, where the Prophet Sallallahu said, إِذَا صَلَّتَ الْمَرْأَةُ خَمْسَهَا وَصَامَتْ شَحْرَهَا وَحَفِذَتْ فَرْجَهَا وَأَطَاعَتْ زَوْجَهَا قِيلَ لَهَا إِدْخِلِي إِدْخِلِي الْجَنَّةِ مِنْ أَيِّ أَبْوَابٍ شِئْتِي The Prophet Sallallahu said, it will be, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, if a woman fasts her five daily prayers, and she, Afwan, if a woman prays her five daily prayers, and she fasts the month, which month? Ramadan. And she protects her privates, and she obeys her husband, it will be said to that woman, enter paradise any door you want. It will be said to that woman, enter paradise any door you want. And there's no doubt our sisters, they say they want Jinnah. And they say they want to see the face of Allah Azza wa Jal. The Prophet Sallallahu gave them something to do. Fast your daily prayers, Afwan, pray your daily prayers. Fast the month of Ramadan, protect your privates, obey your husband, you will enter into Jinnah any door you want. Look at the great reward for those acts of worship. And from those acts of worship is a woman protecting her privates. My dear brothers and sisters, like we said, Islam is a religion that encourages, promotes, orders with upright moral character. And not just because of the harm, but there's a tremendous reward in it. There's a tremendous reward in an individual protecting his chastity. And this was the way of our beloved messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the beginning of his prophethood. From the beginning of his prophethood, our beloved messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was calling the people to Tawheed, the worship of Allah alone, and he was calling the people to protect their chastity. He was calling the people to protect their chastity. You had it in Sahih Bukhari in the book of the beginning of Revelation, which is in the beginning of Sahih Bukhari that Abu Sufyan, who later on became a Muslim, but in this hadith he was not a Muslim yet. And Abu Sufyan is from Mecca. And they were visiting the northern area of the Arabian Peninsula, which is currently known as Saudi Arabia, and the areas of Jordan and Syria and the likes. And you can refer back to the hadith in the beginning of Revelation in Sahih Bukhari. So the people from Mecca were visiting the northern area and the Romans were ruling that area. So the ruler in Roman had heard that there is a man in Mecca claiming to be a prophet. So he called the people from Mecca and said, who knows about who's closest to that man that's claiming to be a prophet? Abu Sufyan, who was not a Muslim yet. Abu Sufyan, who was not a Muslim yet. Later on, he became a Muslim. But at the time that this story took place, he was not a Muslim, but he was related to the Prophet. So he said, I'm, he's, yeah, he's, in my, he's one of my family members. So the Roman ruler called Abu Sufyan and said, I want to ask you questions about him. And he began to ask him questions. And Abu Sufyan was not a Muslim yet. And he said, what is he ordering you to do? He said, he's ordering us to worship one God and to not set up any partners, to worship Allah and to not set up any partners. And he's ordering us to leave alone the idol worship of our fathers. And he's ordering us with honesty, and he's ordering us with what? Chastity. He's ordering us with chastity. And this was, begin, this was in the beginning of the revelation of the Quran. So the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, just like he came with Tawheed, and just like he came with the worship of Allah alone, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with chastity for the men and for the women. When the men and the women of Medina came to visit the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, before the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, before the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina, and he's taking an oath, he's taking an oath from them that when he migrates to Medina, they will worship Allah alone, they will protect, they will support, and they will be chaste. The Prophet ﷺ hasn't even reached Medina yet. 
And it's only a few of the people from Medina coming to Mecca to meet the Prophet ﷺ from the things that the Prophet ﷺ were ordering them to was to be chaste. Notice how Islam teaches us upright moral character. It teaches us values from the beginning of his revelation وسلم, And in that there's a tremendous reward for it. As you had the hadith of Abu Huraira in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet وسلم, said Where the Prophet وسلم, said there will be seven people that will be shaded on a day that there's no, day, there's no shade except that which Allah provides. Yani, Yawm al Qiyamah. And from those seven people, the Prophet ﷺ said, وَرَجُلٌ دَعَتْهُ إِمْرَأَةٌ ذَاتَ مَالٍ وَجَمَالٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ The Prophet ﷺ said, from those seven people that would be shaded on a day, Yani, Yawm al Qiyamah, that there's no shade except the shade that Allah provides. And we know that a day which is difficult, a day which is horrific, a day of fear and torment, a day of punishment. The Prophet ﷺ said that there will be people that would be shaded on that day. Seven. And from those people, the Prophet ﷺ said, a man who is called by a woman who is beautiful and has wealth. So this woman calls him to what? She calls him to fornication or adultery. So the Prophet ﷺ said, so this man is called. He's provoked by a woman. She calls him, she entices him. And he doesn't turn away from her because she's ugly. No, she's beautiful. He doesn't turn away from her because she's poor. The Prophet ﷺ said she's beautiful and she's wealthy. And he says, Inni Allah. He said, I fear Allah. So he turns away from that woman. Look what his reward would be on the day of judgment when people are scared, people are in a state of fright, people are in a state of fear, people are drowning in their sweat. The day that the individual runs from his brother, from his mother, from his father. Everyone is scared on that day. The Prophet ﷺ said there will be people that would be safe on that day. From those individuals that are safe is a person that was called, a man that was called by a woman who's beautiful and wealthy. And he said, I fear Allah. A perfect example of that is in the story of Yusuf ﷺ. Prophet Yusuf ﷺ, that he was raised in the palace of the king. And the wife, the, the queen, wanted Yusuf. She wanted Yusuf. And you can refer back to it in Surah Yusuf. And it's a wonderful surah. Even Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi, said, this surah has more than a hundred benefits. And from the strongest benefits, or the most prominent benefits from Surah Yusuf, is how important it is for an individual to, to abstain from adultery. So Yusuf alayhi salatu salam, in summary, and we know the story, Yusuf alayhi salatu salam was brought up in this house. He was brought up by the king. The king is like his own father. And the queen, she was very attracted to Yusuf. So one day she locked Yusuf in the room and she said, hey Talek, come to me. And Yusuf said, Ma'ad Allah, I seek refuge in Allah. He said, I seek refuge in Allah. And we know, Yusuf ran toward the door. She grabbed him from the back. Ibn Qayyim and other scholars, they say, look at that. Yusuf was young. Yusuf was handsome. This is the queen. She's beautiful. She's wealthy. They're alone. And look how Yusuf ran from that woman. He said everything, Ibn Qayyim and other scholars, they said everything that would encourage a man to fall into this sin was there. They're alone. The king trusts Yusuf. He brought him up like his own son. 
The queen is after Yusuf. It's not like Yusuf is trying to get her. She's the one that's after him. They're alone. He's trusty. He's trustworthy. The queen wants him. She's wealthy. She's beautiful. Everything was there. And Yusuf turned away and ran. And we know, because it doesn't stop there. Later on, the women of the city began to speak ill about the queen. They said, did you hear about the queen? She's trying to entice her boy. She's trying to entice her boy, Yani Yusuf. So when the queen heard that the women are speaking negatively about her, the queen prepared a gathering and she put fruits down and she put mats and she gave out knives. And then she told Yusuf, go out, walk in front of them. Yusuf والسلام, walks in front of them and the women of the city look at Yusuf and they say, glory be to Allah, he can't be a man. He can only be an angel. That's how Yusuf, that's how handsome Yusuf was. That's how handsome Yusuf والسلام, was. So now the women of the city, and we know they cut their hands, they were cutting fruits, they looked at Yusuf and they became distracted by his beauty and they cut their hands. The queen said to those women, that's the one that you're speaking bad about. And yes, I will get him. And yes, I will get him. She didn't stop. And we know that even her husband knew because her husband caught them at the door. Because her husband caught them at the door previously. When the women of the city saw Yusuf, it's mentioned that the women of the city started to do things, even worse. The women of the city started to say to Yusuf, why don't you do it with the queen? So now it's not only the queen that desires Yusuf, but it's the women telling Yusuf to do it with the queen. Some narrations say that the women were saying, they were enticing Yusuf to say, you should just do it. I mean, she's a queen, she wants you, just go with her. And other narrations said that the women of the city said to Yusuf, I'm even better than the queen. Why don't you do it with me? And that's why Yusuf said, Rabbi as-sijnu ahabba ilayya mimma yaj'unani ilayy. Yusuf said, my Lord, jail is more beloved to me than that which they're calling me to. So Yusuf والسلام, preferred to go to jail than to fall into adultery with the queen. And notice what Yusuf is saying. He's saying, my Lord, jail is more beloved to me than that which they are calling me to. That means he's not worried about the queen only, but he's also worried about the women. He's also worried about the women. So Yusuf والسلام, is calling on Allah Azza wa Jal, remove me from these women. Put me in jail to the extent that Shaykh Abdurrahman al Sa'di, rahmatullahi alayhi, or a, a tremendous benefit mentioned by Shaykh Abdurrahman al Sa'di, he said, Hada yadillu ala anna niswa ja'alna yushirna ala Yusuf fi mutawa'ati sayyidatihi. That he said, Shaykh Abdurrahman al Sa'di, he said, This is a proof that the women started encouraging Yusuf to, to give in to her. This is a proof. And they started speaking to Yusuf. And we said, if you go into the books of Tafsir, you find some of them, some of the women were saying, Yusuf, just do it. Just do it. Just be with her. Other women were saying, I'm better than her. Other women were saying, I'm better than her. So it wasn't just the queen that was after Yusuf, it was the queen and the women of the city. So then Shaykh Abdurrahman al Saadi said, فَاسْتَحَبَّ السِّجْنَ وَالْعَذَابَ الدُّنْيَوِي عَلَى لَذَّةٍ حَاضِرَةٍ تُوجِبُ الْعَذَابَ الشَّدِيدِ So Yusuf preferred jail. He preferred to be incarcerated. And he preferred to have a punishment in this dunya. He preferred to have a punishment in this dunya 
instead of having, uh, uh, you know, his, his desires filled, fulfilled presently and having punishment in the hereafter. Punishment of this dunya. Yani Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, understand my brothers and sisters, Yusuf was living in a palace. He was very comfortable. He was extremely comfortable. He had everything he wanted. So him saying, oh Allah, jail is more beloved to me, that's mean he doesn't want this comfort. Take me away from this comfort to protect my chastity. So even the scholars of tafsir, they say, so him living in the palace meant nothing if he had to go to a jail cell in order to abstain from fornication and adultery. So he preferred the discomfort of this life for the comfort of the next life. And that's how a believer should be. You would prefer discomfort in this life. You would prefer to be incarcerated because that comes to an end. This life comes to an end, but the next life is everlasting. So why would you gamble by, by falling into fornication and adultery in this life? Why would you gamble that life and prefer this life, knowing that this life is going to end? Knowing that there's a punishment waiting for you if you fall into fornication and adultery, take the example of Yusuf. Yusuf felt, if I have to go through some discomfort in this life, a year, two years, five years, ten years, but Allah Azza wa Jal has guaranteed for me the next life and the pleasure of Allah, then it's worth it. Then it's worth it. And there are many benefits from the story of Yusuf alayhi salat wa salam. My dear brothers and sisters, and because of that, because of Allah Azza wa Jal knowing the 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 desires and the level of desires and the likes. Allah created us and Allah knows. And Allah knows the chemistry between a man and a woman. Allah created a man and a woman. So there's certain things that are legislated in Islam that protects an individual. Allah Azza wa is not doing these things to harm an individual. He's not doing that which he doesn't legislate, that which he legislates to make life difficult for you. Allah Azza wa Jal legislates it to protect you. Yurid Allahu an yatubu alaykum. Allah wants to forgive you. Yurid Allahu bikum al yusra. Wala yurid bikum al usr. Allah wants ease for you. He doesn't want difficulty for you. So there are certain things that we're going to mention out of many things that Allah Azza wa Jal has legislated in order to protect the believers, the believing men, and the believing women from fornication and adultery. And when you implement these things, by the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal, you will find it easier to stay away from it. From those things is lowering the gaze. From those things is lowering the gaze. As Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned in Surah An-Nur, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُدُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَذُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَسْكَى لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَسْنَعُونَ In Surah An-Nur, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Say to the believing men, Allah Azza wa Jal is ordering the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say to the believing men, lower your gaze and protect your privates. This is better for you. This is better for you. Indeed, Allah is all aware of that which you do. Then Allah says, to the end of the verse and say to the believing women lower your gaze and protect your privates and do not display your beauty except that which is normally seen from it to the end of the verse so in this verse these verses in Surah Nur Allah Azza wa Jal is ordering the believing men and the believing women with something to help you, not with something to make it difficult for us. No, Allah Azza wa Jal is ordering us to do it. Why? Because it protects us. Notice Allah says, lower your gaze and protect your privates. Because lowering your gaze assists you in protecting your privates. And because of that, the Prophet ﷺ said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was his companion and his cousin. 
The Prophet Sallallahu said, Ya Ali, la tutbi'u nadrata an nadrata fa inna laka al-ula wa laysat laka al-akhir. The Prophet Sallallahu said to his cousin and his companion and his son-in-law, the Prophet Sallallahu said, O oh, Ali, do not follow up the look with another look. For verily the first, you're excused, but the second, you're not excused. Do not follow a look with a look. The first, you're excused, but the second, you're not excused. The second, you're not excused. And likewise, you have the hadith of Ibn Abbas in Sahih Bukhari, that the Prophet Sallallahu during the farewell pilgrimage, in the hadith of Jabir as well, that the Prophet Sallallahu was sitting in front of Al-Fadl, and Fadl is his cousin. He's the brother of Ibn Abbas. And they were on Hajj, on Hajj. And a, an attractive woman came to, up to the Prophet Sallallahu to ask him a question. And Fadl, who is young, and he's the brother of Ibn Abbas, and he's the cousin of the Prophet, Fadl is looking at her and she's looking at him. And she's asking the Prophet Sallallahu a question. And the Prophet sees Fadl looking at her and he takes his chin and he turns his chin away. The Prophet Sallallahu took his chin and turned his chin away. Why? Because the eyes lead to the, to the heart. Because the eyes lead to the heart. In that regard, you had a statement by Imam Ibn Kathir in his tafsir where he said, He said, because the sight calls to the corruption of the heart, the sight calls to the corruption of the heart, كما قال بعد الصلف like some of the salaf said النظر سحم سم النظر سحم سم إلى القلب some of the salaf said that the sight is a poisonous arrow straight to the heart what you look at is a poisonous arrow straight to your heart and he said because of that ولذلك أمر الله بحفظ الفروج he said, and because of that, Allah has ordered that we protect our privates and we protect our sight. And we protect our sight. Likewise, it was mentioned by Ibn Qayyim in his book, which is translated, and everyone should have this book, The Disease and the Cure, ad da'u wa dawa Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi, says, النظر أصل he said that your sight in general is one of the reasons why calamities take place with you. Your sight. Then he said, Because your sight gives you an idea. When you think, when you see something, you think about something. وَالْخَطْرَةُ تُولِدْ fikra, And that idea develops into that which is greater. It develops into that which is greater. Then he says, فِكْرَةٌ تُولِدْ shahwa, And that desire, or that which you've imagined now, it turns into a desire. So first it was the sight. Then it was an idea. Now it's a what? A desire. Right? Then he says, ثُمَّ تُولِدْ الشَّهْوَةُ إِرَادَةً The desire would make you think about what you're going to do now. So it all started with a look, then a thought, then a desire. Now you're thinking about what am I going to do? How am I going to get it? Right? ثُمَّ تَقْوَى فَتَسِيرُ عَزِيمَةً جَازِيمَةً He said, and that desire now would continue to become stronger until you make the firm intention to do it. Until you make the firm intention to do it. So, and then he also said, he said, Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, 
also in Adda' wa Dawa, he said, Inna bayna al ayni wa al qalbi man fadhan wa tariqan, fa idha kharabat al ayn wa fasadat kharab al qalb. He said, Indeed, there is a path, Ibn Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi. He said, Indeed, there is a path between the eye and the heart. He said, so if the eye is not protected, it will spoil the, it will spoil the heart. If the eye becomes polluted, looking at stuff, observing stuff, if the eye becomes فَإِذَا خَرَبَتِ الْعَيْنِ وَفَسَدَتْ خَرَبَ الْقَلْبِ وَفَسَدَ He said, so if the eye, if the eye becomes spoiled, it just looks at anything. It doesn't regulate. If the eye becomes spoiled and corrupted, the heart would definitely become spoiled and corrupted. Because there is a direct path from the eye to, from the eye to the heart. Those were some statements by Imam Ibn Qayyim and Imam Ibn Kathir rahmatullahi alayhima. So these are some, so this is one thing that Islam encourages and orders the believers. Even some of the Salaf they said, and I don't have this statement written in front of me, but some of the Salaf said, in general, if you read in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal tells you to look, look at the creation of Allah. So in general, when you read the Quran, Allah says, look at the creation. It's beautiful, it's wonderful. But notice when it comes to looking at that which brings about your desires, Allah says, no, lower your gaze. This is the only thing that Allah tells you to lower your gaze for. Why? Because of its dangers. Other than that, Allah Azawajal says, do not they go throughout the earth and look at the beauty of Allah, look at the ocean of Allah, look at the mountains of Allah, look at the sky, look at the moon. Allah encourages us to look because this strengthens our tawheed. This strengthens, as Allah Azawajal says, وَفِي الْأَرْضِ آيَاتٌ لِلْمُوقِنِينَ Allah Azawajal says, in the earth, there are signs for the people of certainty. In the earth, there are signs for people of certainty. So in general, Allah Azawajal orders the believers to look around you. The sky, the moon, the stars, the ocean, the mountains, to look. But when it comes to this, Allah says, don't, Allah says look. No, Allah says, lower your gaze. Allah Azawajal says, lower your gaze. Another thing that Islam, another thing that Islam encourages in order to protect the believers from fornication and adultery and pornography. The hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim where the Prophet وسلم, said, Ya ma'ashir al-shibab man istata'a minkum al-ba'a fal yatazawwaj. Where the Prophet وسلم, said, O oh, young people, whoever can, and he's speaking to the young men, O oh, young men, whoever has the ability financially and physically, then get married. فَإِنَّهُ أَغَدُّ لِلْبَصَرِ وَأَحْسَنُ لِلْفَرْجِ The Prophet ﷺ said, O oh, young men, whoever has the ability, get married. For verily, it helps you lower your gaze and it helps you protect your privates. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, فَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَتِعْ فَعَلَيْهِ بِسِيَامِ فَإِنَّهُ لَهُ وِيْجَةً Whoever doesn't have the ability, whether physical, physically or financially, then the Prophet ﷺ said, so fast, because it's a protection. So in that hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is encouraging the people to do what? Get married. Because it helps you lower your gaze, and it helps you preserve your privates. So, and likewise, it was mentioned by Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. He said, Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Man arad, Ibn Abbas is saying this, Man arad minkum al zawajnahu. Ibn Abbas said, whoever has the ability, we will get him married. We will get him married. La yazni minkum zanun illa naz'allahu minhu nur al-eeman. Fa in sha'a raddahu wa in sha'a and mana'ahu mana'ahu. Ibn Abbas said, so whoever wants to get married, will get them married. He said, because 
If a person commits fornication and adultery, Allah will remove the light of faith from them. Then Ibn Abbas said, and Allah could give it back or Allah could never give it back. Look, look how Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet, the cousin of the Prophet is saying, if you want to get married, we'll get you married. That protects your privates, that helps you lower your gaze. So if an individual, brother or woman, woman or man, has an, a, a weakness with this, with the opposite sex, or the a'udhu billah, even worse, or they have a witness by looking at that which is haram, then one of the things that Islam has legislated is that a person gets married. Is that a person gets married. He wants to do it to protect himself. He wants to do it to protect himself. And notice what Ibn Abbas said, how they viewed fornication and adultery. He said, because whoever commits it, Allah would remove the light of faith. And Allah can return it, or Allah can never return it. Allah can return it, or Allah Azawajal can never return it. So one of the things that Islam encourages is for a person to get married. Look at the hadith where those individuals came to the house of the Prophet Sallallahu and they asked about his deeds. And then they stood to the side and said, I will pray all night and I will never sleep. And another one said, I will fast all day and I will never break my fast. And the third one said, I will not get married. The Prophet Sallallahu said, you were the ones that said this? Then the Prophet Sallallahu said, I sleep at night and I pray. I fast in the day, I break my fast. And I marry women. Whoever goes against my sunnah, he's not from me. Whoever goes against my sunnah, he's not from me. So if a brother or a sister does not get married, right? The Prophet is saying, you're not from me. So Islam encourages the believer to get married. And if the believer does not have the ability, financially and the likes, Islam encourages you to do what? To fast. Which is the second thing. If you don't have the ability, then fast. Fast. You can fast on Mondays and Thursdays, or you can fast every other day like the Siyam of Dawood, because fasting breaks your desires. Fasting breaks your desires. Likewise, from that which, likewise from that which Islam encourages the believers to do, and to show you how, alhamdulillah, Allah Azawajal gives everyone their rights, is for the believers Is for the believers, for example, where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned about fulfilling the desires between the believers. Something encouraged in Islam. To fulfill the desires, husband and wife. So much so, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in an authentic hadith, if a man sees that which he likes, then what does he do? The Prophet ﷺ said, let him go home and be with his wife. Our beloved Messenger وسلم, said, if you see that which you like, go home and be with your wife. And in the beginning of that hadith, the Prophet وسلم, said, إِذَا أَقْبَلَتِ الْمُرْعَى أَقْبَلَ وَمَعْهَا الشَّيْطَانِ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ صلى الله عليه وسلم. If a woman goes out, if a woman goes out, the shaitan joins her. The shaitan beautifies her. So the Prophet ﷺ said, so if you see something that's desirable, then go home to your family. Then go home to your family. It even took place that the companions were sitting with the Prophet ﷺ one day. And they were talking with our beloved Messenger ﷺ. And a female passed. And the Prophet ﷺ got up and went to his house, into his home. And he came back out ﷺ, and his hair was dripping with water. So the companion said, Ya Rasulullah, what happened? And the Prophet said, somebody passed, I went inside. Said, this is what Allah Azawajal has given you. This is what Allah Azawajal has given you. But not only with the men, even with the women. As Allah Azawajal says in the Quran, بالمعروف, The women have rights similar to the men. It took place during the time of Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. That Umar used to go out to check on the society at night. What's going on? 
Umar alayhi salat, uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu used to go out and he used to check on the society. What's going on? Are people in need? And the likes. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu passed by a home. And this hadith is in Sahih uh, Sunan and Nisa'i and in other books. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu passed by a home and he heard a woman saying lines of poetry. She said, Tatawala hadha laylu waswadda janibu wa tala alayya alla khalila ulaibu fa wallahi lawla khashyatullahi wahdahu la hurrika min hadha siriri jawanibu. The woman was saying lines of poetry and Omar listened. She said, This night is long and it has become dark. And it is long upon me and I do not have someone to play with. Yani? So Umar ibn Khattab anhu, heard this female mentioning lines of poetry. That this night has long and it's become dark. And it is difficult, it's long upon me. I don't have a friend to play with. Yani, her husband. She said, I swear by Allah, if it was not from the fear of Allah, this bed would be shaking right now. So when Umar heard her say this, she's saying, if, it, if I did not fear Allah, this bed would be shaking. So Umar went to his daughter, Hafsa, the wife of? The wife of? The Prophet so Umar went to Hafsa and said, what's, what's the Umar asked about this woman? They said, she's married, but her husband is in a battle. Her husband is in a battle. So Umar went to Hafsa and said, how long can a woman be patient without her husband? Hafsa was a bit embarrassed. He said, no, I need to know. So then Hafsa said, maybe three months or the likes. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that if there's a man fighting jihad, he cannot stay away longer than three months. And he called for her husband to come back. And he got another woman from the Ansar and told her, let her stay with you until her husband comes back. Let her stay with you until her husband comes back. So Islam encourages that the men and the women fulfill their desires in a halal manner. So much so that Umar made it a legislation. If you go into the books of fiqh, the books of fiqh about jihad, they said it's not permissible for a man to stay away from his wife for that, that amount of time. For that amount of time. And if he does, she has the right to seek a divorce. Why? She has desires and he has desires. So Islam has legislated certain things for the believers to fulfill their desires. As we mentioned marriage, as we mentioned fasting, as we mentioned taking care of each other's desires, and even if the man has the ability financially and physically to take another wife, then you should take another wife. What would a brother say? And may Allah Azawajal protect us all. What would a brother say to Allah Azawajal on Yawm Qiyamah where he had a wife and he was still committing adultery or watching pornography? What would you say to Allah when Allah says to you, I gave you the ability to have four? 
I made it permissible for you to have four, but instead of having four, you were, you had a girlfriend? You were watching pornography? You could have had the real deal. So my dear brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, Islam has legislated certain things to protect us. Not, once again, not to make things difficult for us. Not to punish us. But for Allah Azzawajal to make it easy for us and to reward us. So Islam has legislated marriage. Islam has legislated fasting. Islam has legislated fulfilling the desires. Likewise, Islam has legislated, like the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, that a man is not alone with a woman except the shaitan is the third. Why? Because if they do not have someone there, they can fall into it. Islam has legislated even in the most pious place, the masjid. The Prophet ﷺ said, خَيْرُ السُّفُفُ الرِّجَالِ أَوَّلُهَا وَشَرُّهَا آخِرُهَا وَخَيْرُ صُفُوفِ النِّسَاءَ آخِرُهَا وَشَرُّهَا أَوَّلُهَا The most religious and spiritual place on the face of the earth, the masjid. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the best rows for the men are the first, and the worst are the last, and the best rows for the women are the last, and the worst are the first. Why? So that the women do not see the men. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ, because there were different doors open. There were different doors in his masjid. The Prophet ﷺ said, لو جعلنا هذا الباب للنساء. The Prophet ﷺ said to his companions, why don't we make that door specifically for women? It's mentioned that Ibn Umar anhu, when the Prophet said that Ibn Umar for the rest of his life never came through that door. Never came through the door of the women. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said that should be the door of the women. Keep the women away from the men. Likewise, it's mentioned in the authentic sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, after he made salat, the Prophet ﷺ would not turn around and he would give it some time so that the women could disperse. And this is the masjid. This is the place that's religious and spiritual. But even with that, the Prophet ﷺ was very careful to make sure that the men are separate from the women to protect the individual, to protect the individual. And likewise, the Prophet ﷺ said, for me to be spiked in the head with a steel spike is better for me than to touch a woman. The scholar said, so our beloved messenger ﷺ would prefer to be spiked in the head, physically harmed, than to touch the hand or the body of someone that's not permissible for him. So Islam forbid that men and women are together alone. Islam forbid that the woman travels without a mahram. Islam forbids that the man touches a woman that he's not permissible for. Islam forbids all of these things. Why? To protect the individual from fornication and adultery. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is a very important topic. And the opposite goes for the society. The society calls to indecency. The society calls the women to un undress themselves and to act in an impermissible way in permissible manner. Islam forbids the women to show their beauty outside. Islam forbids the women to wear perfume outside, travel alone, be alone. Why? Because Allah Azza wants to protect them. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala wants to protect them. So this is a very important topic and individuals that have fallen into it whether fornication and adultery the individual should understand the severity of it. But even if an individual falls into it, an individual sh should not despair from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. From that which the individual should do is supplicate to Allah Azza wa Jal to ask Allah Azza wa Jal to rid them of it. <coughs> this individual should supplicate to Allah to ask Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala to rid the individual of it. It's authentically reported in the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu that a young man came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, then leave zina. A young man came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said, Ya Rasulullah, allow me to commit adultery. Allow me to commit adultery. And the companions heard this, so they began to, rid it, to rebuke him. They began to, to, to uh, rebuke him and to speak ill. What are you doing? Are you foolish? And the likes. The Prophet ﷺ said, bring him close. 
Then the Prophet وسلم, said, would you like it for your mother? He said, no, I swear by Allah, I would not like it for my mother. He said, and people don't like it for their mothers. He said, do you like it for your daughter? He said, I swear by Allah, I don't like it for my daughter. He said, and no one likes it for their daughter. Do you like it for your sister? He said, I swear by Allah, I don't like it for my sister. He said, and people don't like it for their sisters. Do you like it for your niece? I swear by Allah, I don't like it for my niece and people don't like it for their niece. Do you like it for your aunt? Why is the Prophet saying all of these women? Because if you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it with somebody's mother or somebody's daughter or somebody's sister or someone's aunt. So the Prophet is going to every category of women. And then the Prophet said, Allahumma, Allahumma, oh Allah, tahir, tahir qalbahu wa ghafir dhambahu. The Prophet said, oh Allah, purify, and he brought him close and put his hand on him and said, oh Allah, purify his heart and forgive his sin. Oh Allah, purify his heart and forgive his sin. It is said that that, that young individual did not have a problem after that. He did not have a problem. Oh Allah, forgive his sin and purify his heart. And it's another narration that says, and protect his privates. After that, لم يكن يلتفت إلى شيء. He did not look at anything after that. Yani, it was no longer a problem for him. So one, dua. The Prophet ﷺ is making dua for him. So a person make dua for themselves. And we already said another dua. The dua of Yusuf. Remember, Yusuf said, Oh Allah, I prefer to be incarcerated than to fall into this. If I have to give away luxury and comfort in this dunya to please you and receive the reward on Yom Qiyamah, it's worth it. It's worth it. So if an individual has to change his environment, move somewhere else, get a different job, is it not worth it, my dear brothers? Yusuf went from a palace to a jail. Hafid ibn Kathir, if I'm not mistaken, because I don't have it in front of me. Hafid ibn Kathir, I believe it was Hafid ibn Kathir, he brought a great fa'idah. He brought a great fa'idah from the story of Yusuf. He said, Yusuf went from a palace to a jail because he preferred that over the comfort of being with the queen. And he stayed in jail for many years. But what was the outcome? He was released from jail and became the governor. So Allah took him from a big place to a small place to a huge place. Look at the status that Allah gave Yusuf والسلام, for his patience in abstaining from fornication and adultery. Look at the reward, the great reward that Allah Azawajal gave him. So making dua. Likewise, learning your deen. Learning your deen and realizing that even if you fell into something, you do not despair from the mercy of Allah Azawajal. You do not despair from the mercy of Allah. You don't just give up and say, I'm doing it, khalas, I'm just going to continue doing it. No, because my dear brothers, that's what the shaitan wants from you. That's what the shaitan wants from you. There's a hadith, there's an athar, where, or the, it's a hadith actually, where the shaitan, and it's authenticated, where the shaitan swore to Allah, وَعِزَّتُكَ لَا أَرْبَهُ أَغْوِيهِمْ مَا دَامَتْ أَرْوَاهُهُمْ فِي أَجْسَادِهِمْ That the shaitan promised Allah, swore by Allah. He said, I swear by your might, I will continue to guide them astray as long as their souls are in their body. He said, I swear by your might, I will continue to guide them astray as long as their souls are in their body. Then what does Allah Azawajal says? وَعِزَّتِي وَجَلَالِي لَا أَزَالُ أَغْفِرُ لَهُمْ مَا دَامُوا يَسْتَغْفِرُونِي Then Allah Azawajal responded to the shaitan, I swear by my might and my greatness, I will continue to forgive them as long as they seek my forgiveness. So the shaitan is promising. I'm going, no, as long as they're alive, I'm going to guide them astray. As long as they're alive, I will guide them astray. And Allah says, and I promise, as long as they seek my forgiveness, I will forgive them. 
So my dear brothers and sisters, even if you fell into it, you should not despair from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. And look at the companions of the Prophet. Even some from the companions fell into this type of indecency. And you had the, the story of Ma'az, one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he approached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have committed adultery. Purify me. And what's purification for adultery? Stoning. Stoning. And the scholars of Islam said, why is it stoning? So that every part of your body can feel the pain just like every part of your body felt the pleasure. Stoning. So you should feel every part of your body can feel the pain just like every part of your body felt the pleasure. So Ma'iz came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, I committed adultery. Not fornication. Adultery. Purify me. Several narrations said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned away from him. Why? Keep it between you and Allah. Turn to Allah. Turned away from him. Ma'iz came from the other direction. Prophet turned. He came from the other direction. So much so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, is he, is he okay? And they said, yeah, no. They said, yeah, so he's fine. Prophet ﷺ said, has he been drinking? One of the companions stood up and smelled his breath and said, no, Rasulullah, he hasn't been drinking. Then the Prophet ﷺ ordered the companions to wrap him and stone him. Why? Because Ma'iz did not want to deal with it on Yom Qiyamah. If you get the punishment now, then you don't have to deal with it on Yom Qiyamah because Yom Qiyamah could be much worse. So Ma'iz preferred the punishment in this life. After Ma'iz did that, a female came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, I committed adultery and don't try to turn away from me like you try to turn away from him. Look at her sincerity. She said, don't try to turn away from me. But she was pregnant. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, carry your load and come back. Scholars of Islam said the Prophet ﷺ, had she not come back, the Prophet would have not gone for her. Keep it between you and Allah. She came back and said, Ya Rasulullah, I gave birth. The Prophet ﷺ said, go breastfeed for two years. Two years. Go breastfeed. Scholars of Islam said, had she went and breastfed and not come back, the Prophet wouldn't have searched for her. She came back with the baby eating, meaning he's not breastfeeding anymore. Because once they start eating, they don't breastfeed anymore. She came back and the baby was holding a piece of bread. She said, Ya Rasulullah, I've breastfed. It's two years. He's eating. Purify me. She's saying, purify me. I don't want to meet a lot with this. I don't want to meet a lot with this. So they wrapped her. They stoned her. Her blood splattered on one of the companions. And he wiped it and cursed her. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and in another narration is mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed over her and one of the companions said, Ya Rasulullah, are you going to pray over her? And she's a, an adulteress. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, she repented to the extent if her toba was spread over 70 of you, it would suffice. That's how sincere she was. She did not want to meet Allah with, on her, with this on her slate. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is a reality. And it's something that Islam has put certain measures that if you abide by those measures, it would be a means of protection. It would be a means of protection. But if you fall into it, then there's tawbah to Allah Azza wa Jal. And do not despair. Because the shaitan, it's not important that you sin. What he wants from you is that you despair from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is upon us to reflect as we mentioned in the story of Yusuf and how Yusuf would preserve, prefer jail and being incarcerated and his comfort and luxury of the dunya to be removed. But to think about that which Allah Azza wa Jal has prepared for you in Jannah and the great reward and the forgiveness and the bliss that Allah Azza wa Jal has prepared for you if you only, only be patient for a moment in this life. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us from those who are patient we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to protect us. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to purify our hearts. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to keep us far from the shaitan and close to the believers. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to increase us in iman and to increase us in taqwa. 
As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say, Allahumma ati nafsa taqwaha. Oh Allah, give my soul its taqwa. Wa zakiha anta khayru man zakkaha. And beautify my, my faith. You are the one to beautify it. So we ask Allah Azawajal to purify and beautify our faith. Allah knows best wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kathira.